My name's Steve Stroud. I'm a musician from Liverpool. Today I'm sitting down to talk to a local legend and one of my personal musical heroes, Kenny Parry. Kenny has been a member of legendary bands such as the Merseys, Colonel Bagshot and Liverpool Express. He has toured with Slade, written for Barry Manilow and since the late 60s played alongside Billy Kinsley at concerts all over the world. So whether you were a fan back in the day or are just discovering Kenny for the very first time, sit back and enjoy my visit with a legendary local. What was the transition between, you know, playing in school, meeting Billy Kinsley and getting into the Mersey Beats well, in the late 60s? First off, it was to, to youth, the youth club bands. We played the youth club dancers. And then I met friends who introduced me to uh, this band, The Modes. I went to Hunt Cross and practiced with them, you know, and uh, carried on from that, really, because nothing lasted for a, a long time then, you know. Then we got the three-piece, as I said, the rig. That was in Bootle. I had to get three buses there to do an audition. Stuck um, Eric Clapton on the record deck doing uh, Key to the Highway and started playing along to it and then um, got the job. You know. Were you part of like a, a social scene where everyone was doing the cavern and everyone was, you were all doing the same kind of venues and you all knew each other? Was it that sort of scene at that time? Yeah, oh, it was fantastic. You can't describe it to anyone who wasn't there. You can't describe the magic and the atmosphere, the being alive. And, We'd go down, we wouldn't worry about, you know, was it a toilet or was it getting the bus home or anything. We'd just stay and walk home sometimes to Garston, you know, from, from town in the early light. Did the cavern, because it was even then in those sort of early days, did it still have that mystique because it broke the Beatles? Yeah, oh, fantastic yeah. atmosphere, rotten smell, terrible uh, drains. I wish I wish I could do a, a, a Vulcan mind implant with you or something to feel it because you're never going to be able to describe it to anyone. It was total, pure magic. And it was girls. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, I've been doing, um, the last few years, I've been doing uh, Liverpool Rocks for a fellow called Judd Lander. And I've been doing it the last few years, and it's been lovely to see all the old uh, friends like Bill Kinsley, Battle Mars, and Jeff Nugent when he was alive, The Undertakers. So I, that was all from my area, you know. I was one of the youngest ones on the scene then, believe it or not. Were you the kid? Yeah, I'm 71 now, but I, I was the kid. So how did you meet Billy? Oh, my God. I think I fell down the cliff and there he was at the bottom or something like that. <laughs> how did I meet Billy? See, I was playing in a band. I think it might have been the rig. By then, the Maisie Beats had um, disbanded. They'd had the hits, I think, of you in Sorrow, etc. They were now just called the Maisies, Billy, Kinsey and Tony Crane at the front. And they had a backing band called the Fruit Eating Bears, <laughs> which I became a Fruit Eating Bear. <laughs> <laughs> You've had some great names. But that wasn't, yeah, that wasn't my name now. But they had that, you know, and then uh, I joined and the first gig was, uh, the first gig was in Scotland. And I, I had my own Gibson, Les Paul and a uh, Marshall Stag. And then the next week, the fella who owned all that gear left. So I... <laughs> So it was my job to go around begging the, the support bands could be used their gears. Saying, because we'd had ours robbed in the cabin, you know. So at that point, Billy's a pretty big deal. Not oh, just yeah. not just in Liverpool, just he's a pretty big deal everywhere. But how was it for you? Now it just seems so casual because you you and him being friends for years. But at the time, was that like did it feel like a huge step up from what you'd been doing? Oh yeah. And we started travelling, you know, as I said, the first one was in Scotland and then we were all over the country and it, <laughs> Ever said musicians had that easy, they want to try a few things. Because we were sleeping in vans with no heaters, sitting on equipment, going from like John O'Groats to Scotland and and all that, you know. So I'm sure everyone probably assumed you had this glamorous life because you 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 win this main band and No, we didn't really. Um, the Maisie Beats did. They were all getting chauffeured everywhere and Rolls Royces and all that, but what happens with me, I usually get the call when the band's, uh, you know, when the, the manager's run off to Brazil with the money and uh, someone's pinched someone else's wife and they're all falling to bits. And that's when I usually get the call, you know. When the heads have dried up and everything. <laughs> you step in and save the day. Yeah, yeah. save the day. That sounds good. I remember you saying it was your turn because everyone got to play with the Mersey Beats and the Mersey's back. Yeah, it was like national service. Yeah. <laughs> you all know, get some in. How long was the Mersey Beats era for you until you kind of went into Colonel Bagshot and all that kind of stuff? I knew Bagshot's... I'd seen them, you know, and they were like a more of a soul band then. They had two singers, two great singers, Brian Farrell and Mike Byrne. And I first saw them doing You've Lost That Loving Feeling. And, and Dave Dover on bass, who's just the best bass player in Liverpool. And uh, 
different sort of people, Teddy McCusker. Uh, but I saw them and I was just knocked out. We was, I think we were supporting them on a the college. So then uh, they had a, a fella called Mike Conzel who was playing with them and he was great, smashing blog, great guitarist. And he, he left because they were doing a version of Hair, one of Brian's scare-brained things, you know. But they were doing a version of that. We didn't take our clothes off, but it got close to the bone. And he didn't want to do it, so they, they auditioned me. And uh, I joined in with it, you know, with, with all this mad gear and all that. You had to keep your clothes on. We did, yeah, but uh, I wouldn't have minded then because I was dead skinny, you know. <laughs> did you know about the 2018 remix of Six Day War? By the Turkish chap. Mama Zohan, yeah, that's, that's had 19 million hits. It's gone up. I checked it today. 141 million views. I don't get anything for, for you don't get anything for YouTube plays, but I have had mechanicals of it. Brian, who wrote it, Brian Farrell, he, he's probably had a lot more than me, but all the rest of the band got these mechanicals, which I think the most we ever got was two grand, but um, people saying to me, you know, you should be getting millions of pounds off this, but... Yeah, well, that's what I was thinking, you know, because you would have had, even if you didn't write the song, that's performance royalty, wouldn't you? Yeah, well, I have. We've had some performance royalties, because we signed publishing to a fellow called Chaz Pete in London, and uh, we were young then, you know what I mean? Yeah. Stick a, a contract in front of you. Well, if you don't sign by the end of the week, you don't get to make a record, you know. I've never been good at sort of tracking down money, you know. I'm not a, just not a good business brain. I'm sure there's stacks of it out there. Well, back then, was everyone savvy about the performance rights organisations and all that? I've always been in PRS, but I didn't write any of that, you see. I wrote one song on it called uh, I've Seen the Light. It was my nod to uh, Neil Young because he did a song called Helpless and I thought, oh, I can do that, you know. So we, we did that one, I've seen the light, but... Uh, oh, I've seen the light, I don't want to know. Oh, bit of magic. Is it true, have I got the story right, that Colonel Bagshot went on for a while but then Brian Farrell got a deal and he left? The, the manager there, Peter Tyre, he took Brian over, you know. I can't remember how it, it felt a bit, really. I think we just drifted apart, you know. We were all trying to earn a living off it. Because I, I never wanted to work, you know. I just wanted to, to live off my music. Only so that we could make more music. You know, we didn't want Ferraris or... Just to keep it playing, keep playing, pay the bills, keep playing. You know, I was married then. I got married at 20. To... to Jan, who I met in the cabin. If the story ended there, it's, it's a fantastic tale, but, but then you ended up, um, late 70s, meeting up again with Billy. Yeah. For Liverpool Express. I was, I was just uh, sat here one night on my own, thinking, that's it, you know. Mm. And uh, I got a call off Billy to go for it. Well, that wasn't an audition, it was like an interview. So I spruced myself all up, you know, put my bezzy leather jacket on <laughs> and all that, and then... Um, come home, dance around the room. Because I'd seen Liverpool Express when before they they, they went on the upward slope uh, on the Star and Garter in uh, Liverpool uh, with the keyboard player, Roger, Tony Coates, Billy and Deke the drummer. Oh, you've never seen anything like it. What a band. Apparently from that gig, Star and Garter, it turned out the Frank who I work with on the club. Um, he was in there that night, but we never knew each other. But both recall how, how Billy was all in denim. And he was always a great looking fella, you know, and, um, and he had all the hair down and he was doing uh, doing Dreamer. And uh, with his little, you know, <laughs> his little giggle. And, uh, and his little personality, it's great in here, and, you know, he's had all that going for him. But the band was one of the best musical bands ever. Since the Beatles, I would say. So they, they kind of merged it. They took that sort of Mersey Beat sound and then they they updated it, didn't they? It was it didn't sound like a 60s band, it sounded like of the of the day something. No. Well Billy's lucky in, in a way. His voice sits on tape beautifully. Mine always had to be it mangled a bit, you know, frequencies added and all that. It, it didn't just like Peter Gabriel, boom, right onto tape. Other people, Dusty Springfield. You know, mine always had to be tweaked and 
Why do you think that is? Do you think it because you had a high range because you were singing? It could be just the, the frequencies, yeah. I'm sure they've got software now that'll do it, you know. Yeah, they've got software that'll sing it for you now. Make, make me sound like Peter Gabriel software. <laughs> <laughs> so you were kind of a fan before you even got the call? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I went down, I fixed up a pracky with them and then uh, just started playing with them. Going all over the country. Did you know the, I mean, I know you knew, you knew Billy, but did you know the other guys well before you joined? Not as well as I knew Billy. I'd not, I'd not worked with any of them, but I did know them all. Yeah, and Dick, Dick the drummer, Derek, Derek Cashin, he was just great. He was, he was a pop drummer, but with a little bit of edge to it, you know, and very musical. And they all sang, the whole band, were, were, were great harmonists. Join, joining a band, it's, it's the, the dynamics of it. It's like, it's like a relationship or a family, isn't it? Because you've got all these different personalities, strong personalities, this and that. So you know, getting on is. I think something people overlook, but just being able to get along with like three other people or four other people is, is a... Well, it, you don't, do you really? Because most bands come to an end, because most bands clash in the end. And, and to use a rude word, it's, it's like being married to three bastards. <laughs> <laughs> so, things that you liked about them during the honeymoon period start to really irritate you, you know. But I mean, Billy's main thing was, it was his punctuality. If I could have all the time I've spent, and he won't mind me saying this, I've spent waiting for him places, but he, you know, he didn't come till an hour or two late. <laughs> I'd have another year on, on my life. I was reading that there was something in the plug-in book about that, where you'd, uh, you'd been waiting for him to turn oh. up and he was late, and you were kind of in a bit of a mood. I'll tell you, yeah. I, I had to save him a place on the train, we were going to do some sessions, and I didn't have the address, so he said, I'll meet you on the nine o'clock train. Yeah. So I'm sitting there, I've got the guitar next to me and all these businessmen are huffing and puffing at me, you know, and I say, I'm saving a seat. So I got to Houston and he never got the train. And uh, so I had to wait till the next train because I didn't know where we were going. So when he comes on the next train and I am not speaking <laughs> to him, I am angry, you know. So we marched through, through London to the tube stations and I mean, about eight feet apart, you know. And uh, we, we come to this escalator, a flat escalator going across the road. And uh, still not speaking, we got all these guitars and bags on us and everything. And as we're going along, <clears throat> this girl came along the other side with a mini skate on. So we're both, you know, goggling at that. <laughs> Next thing over we went. And we're rolling over each other and we got guitar straps up our noses and guitars around our heads and bags. And this girl is just having such a laugh at us, you know. Oh, she's laughing around right us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just smiling, you know, looking at us. And she knew she had it, like, but... Um, so for the next three days, we couldn't look at each other without laughing. And that's the, it was always that way. He's got, he's got a charm about him, you know. You can get you angry, but he always he squeezes his way out of it. <laughs> well, he saved your life once as well, didn't he? Oh yeah, hey, what a dubious <laughs> honour that is. Yeah, on, uh, on stage in um, Colwyn Bay, end of the pier club. I'd already tested the mic with the back of, your hand, back of my hand, because then if you're going to get a shock, you won't grab the mic. Then I'd done that, but I went to move it, and the next thing I'm stuck. You need another hour for me to describe that to you. So you're getting electrocuted and you can't move. Very badly, like a thousand pe people with pliers all over you. Billy had experienced that before with the... Um, Joey Molland. Yeah. So he knew what to do, so he went over and pulled all the plugs out and everything. It saved me life, because I went to run off the stage, but I was disorientated, so I went sideways. So he ran over and pulled the plugs out quick. And when it happened with Joey Molland, all, all his uh, strings were bent into his fingers, and uh, you know, I had to go to hospital and all that. They were coming to pick me up, and I had a little tiny bit of scotch I'd left in the dressing room. I know, I like a drop of scotch. And uh, they, they got there with the van, and I said, oh, where's my scotch? And Billy said, well, we drank it because we thought you might be dead. <laughs> <laughs> you're fuming again. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if, if you're best known, but you're, you're really well known for So What. So what, I'll get over you. So what, I'll find something to do on this love. It was my basic idea, and I dreamed it, actually. I, I dreamed that. I dreamed there was in the place and there was a band. I've done that a lot. Like a scrambled eggs man. Scrambled eggs, yeah. And um, so I went downstairs and put the first few lines down. I thought, 
Zach Pizzi Avid is that, you know. Did you just have the melody? Do, 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 or did yeah. you have the words straight away? I, I had so, so what? I don't know, I can't remember how much more I had. So we went, I was going down to Billy's that day and I went down and I just, I've listened to this, you know, and I thought, this is the average, this. I, I played what I had, you know. So what, I'll get over you. So what, I'll find something to do on these lonely nights. It's good to be free. So, so he said, uh, no, it's good that, let's... You know, let's milk it a bit. And we did, and squoze it and milked it and uh, had a song. But what happened was we recorded it in Amazon in the uh, 8 track, which was analog. Great version, you know, just a couple of takes and it all rolled on. Basically got the, the bass and the drums and, and the guitar down first, and then the vocals and added the harmonies, etc. That was Brian Rawling on drums, now he's... Um, the producer, the producer, yeah, big he's, time producer. He's the guy that's worked with Cher and, and the auto yeah. tune and all that. Drummer? <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> so uh, it was a good version, and then um, we sent it to Clive Davis, who was the, the Bee Gees manager at the time. And also, I think he had Barry Manilow, and uh, he wrote back and said, it's fantastic, you know, blah, blah, etc. Barry Manilow is going to do a demo of it. Then he said, he wrote back and he said, um, it, it's good, but it's a bit uh, primitive, the recording of it, you know, because it was eight track. He said, so do it again. So we did it some like nine or 10 times again over the course of so, so many years. And he eventually wrote back and he said, uh, we sent him a version and he said, it's very good, but you, you've never captured the uh, spirit that you got on the why would he? Why, why would he need... I'm probably being ignorant, but if, if if it was a song for Barry Manilow, why didn't he just take your demo and get Barry to record a new version? Well, from what I can gather, he did do a demo of it, you know, with, with luck or the stars or whatever goes on. I think that's as far as it got. Because I'd have been quids in if he'd done that. Me and Billy. Well, it's a world-class song, and, you know, I mean, I've, I've heard you do it live, and I was going to talk to you about, you know, being on stage. I, I don't want to be all gushing, but I... Gush, dear boy, gush. <laughs> gush, <laughs> gush. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a far less successful, but I'm a singer, and you know, and I, I see you do what you do, and you know, I, you're a real master at it, you know. Because I was just wondering, do you ever get stage anxiety? Because you just seem so funny and relaxed on stage, and you, you're quick-witted, and you, you're bantering with the audience, and you're playing flawlessly and singing flawlessly, and it just looks so natural. But did you ever get nervous, or is this just the way it's always been for you? Every single time. And I do suffer, and I've always suffered from really bad lack of confidence. Don't push myself enough. Um, yeah, lack of confidence, especially in my guitar playing, you know, it's never good enough. And he, he, only recently I'm sort of saying, well, this, this is it now. Um, just do what you do, you know, stop preparing yourself and trying to be this, trying to be that, and I'm enjoying it more, you know. That's nice to hear. I would have assumed you wouldn't have those feelings because, you know, you're so good. Oh, thanks, but I, I'm, without blowing my own trumpet, I, I just don't think I'm big-headed enough to have been, didn't have the ego to become a, you know, There's probably a, a lot superstar of truth. or whatever, yeah. yeah. There's probably a lot of truth in that. I could never pose as well as Billy. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean that with respect. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you watch him on stage and he's got all the moves and he's, you know, he's looking at all the girls and all that. Well, we've all done that. But yeah, yeah. Did he get nervous or was it just... Billy, no, I don't think so. I never saw it. He's a terrible giggler. He just giggles all the time, and, and you know, there's so many laughs that we had. I don't know where to start, to dig in. There's a time we had to share a four post of bed, because it was either that or sleep on the floor. So we were at opposite ends of the bed, you know, and about six in the morning, the sun's coming through these lace curtains and all that. And I'm just lying there, you know. And next thing, I felt this arm come over me. And uh, I saw this face, it looked like, you know, he was a dog that just been given the bone. <laughs> I knew what was happening. He thought it was his missus. So I just tapped him. I said, Billy, does this mean we're engaged? <laughs> and the next thing, we both shot, you know, like that scene in Trains, Boats yeah, and Airplanes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both shots at the other end of the bed. Oh, what do you think of the game on Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> And he, was, he went to the bathroom, he's, oh, no! Oh, stuff like that. You couldn't 
count the laughs we've had. You were a really phenomenal guitarist. I mean, you wouldn't have been in so many top bands as a guitarist if you weren't. I mean, and everybody I speak to in Liverpool just goes on about Kenny with the voice. He's the guy with the voice. Yeah. So you, you're really well known as a singer. And I'm just wondering, is that ever been like a conflict? Am I a singer? Am I a guitarist? No. I'll tell you what it was. It was all, I've always worked in tandem with the guitar. I'm not a mad soloist. I don't do solos all night and, and, and play all through the song. I play with rhythm and get back. I'm not really a chord player, you know. So, like I did a song called Out on the Limp when I was... That's the way I've always you're not really been a chord player. I've always had the two working with each other. So you're weaving? Yeah, you're absolutely weaving. weaving. All stuff like that out on a limb. Yeah. Do me solo and, and get back to the song. I sometimes put little flicky bits in, you know. I'm not fancy, you know, I'm, I can't do hammer-ons and all that stuff. I've seen you do a hammer-on. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's been an accident, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, another thing in that, um, that, that plug-in book, it, it, it mentioned, uh, it was talking about gear and guitarists and, you know, like so-and-so always plays a Gibson Les Paul, et cetera, et cetera. They made a comment about you, said, Kenny's not a gear snob. He'll play anything, he'll play a plank, but he'll make it sing. My telephone, which everyone knows in Liverpool, I, I knocked that together with, Billy sold me that neck, I think, for a, a bottle of scotch. And I got a body made. So for those who don't understand, a telephone is a telecaster and an epiphone joined together, is that right? Epiphone neck, telecaster body. It cost me about 40 quid altogether for the whole thing. No, nothing matches on it, none of the pickups or anything. But it, it's got mojo. Some fella said that to me once and, and I never realised, he said. You always go back to that guitar, he said, because it's got mojo. It's, oh, it's a, it's, it's a Scouse icon, that guitar now, isn't it? It's like everyone in Liverpool. That, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I've been talking to people, you know, leading up to this interview, and uh, two or three people have said, oh, ask him about his telephone. Everyone knows the telephone, they do. Well, it, as I say, it's all different parts, different bits, and uh, I've got, I've had, God, yeah, everyone knows me. I've, I've had Gibson, Strats, all kinds, but I always go back to that. It's comfy with me, you know. Another question I was going to ask is, because you, you've been in and out of the music business since the 60s. You've, you've toured all over the place with big bands. You toured with Slade, didn't you? Three, um, three European tours with Slade. Was it as fun as that sounds? It sounds like a lot of fun going on the European tour with Slade, but or was it hard work? It was equal measure because on the first tour, we were on expenses from Polydor and we were staying at the... Uh, Holiday Inn in Helsinki and all that, you know. And we were ordering all kinds of fancy food and drinks and, you know. And uh, it, that was a ball, I thought, it was just great. And then we got back to London and uh, I think it was Brian, he went into Polydor and said, don't you think you'd better sign us, you know? And the fella said, what? He said, well, well nobody signed us. And if I've got the story right, one person in the office thought the other one had signed us. And one person in the other office thought Office A had signed us. So we weren't signed to them. So they couldn't get the money back off us or anything. They threw us out. But uh, the next two tours we went on um, with Slade, it was a bit different. You know, we were we was scrabbling around the back streets for, for little hotels and fighting with Slade's roadies for food. What was Slade like? Were they nice fellas? Smashing. Nice guys, yeah. yeah. Smashing. Um, by the time we got on tour with them, and we, we had a few nice little meals with them and, and all that, you know. And we had a good chat with them. Only Dave Hill was... He, he was a tiny little bit egotistical, but he, it was so easy to bring him down. Well, he was the haircut alone. <laughs> yeah. But basically, underneath it all, <laughs> he was all right. He was always nice. Yeah. He, he used to try and, um, you know, he'd pose. I said, well, let me order the wine, you know, because I'd been reading up on it. And the waiter had come out and 
screw the top off, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I was wine can of sit. And, and he had this look that he caught me out, hadn't he? So, but they were smashing blokes. So if you had to do it all again, but try and make it in the music business in 2019, just say you were 18 year old now, because there'll be 18 year olds listening to this. The way the business has changed, what, do you think it's easier now or do you think it's harder now? That is such a big question now. I mean, the only thing anywhere near me that's 18 years old now is my car. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it's, it's all different now, and it? I mean, it, that might sound like an old fogey, but you know, you, you put like Beyonce on and all, all the stuff the kids are listening to, and uh, Ariana Grande. It's, it is computerized, isn't it, you know? But you can't get away from it because whoever, which one of us wants to go back to uh, splicing tapes and all that, you know? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, yeah, how easy is it to kind of do yeah, this? Just, without, you just yeah. move, move it along. But I, I think the magic of the old days is in people like you. It's, it's, it's not about gear. I don't think it's about tape hiss. I think it's about people who could actually play their instruments really well live. Well, it, yeah, it's, it's how you, you separate, a, you know, a verse from a chorus and a chorus from a solo and, and make them individual parts. Whereas now it's, it's just, it's all compressed and, and, and flat. Not all of it, you know, yeah. but a lot of it. One of the most beautiful songs I've, I've heard from you was a picture from the cavern which you wrote for Jan. It was a picture from the cavern when you were 17 A memory of the songs that we once sung A picture from yeah, She died in uh, September 2013 and it got to about November and obviously it was very twisted up, very de devastated then. And I just did it. And, and it, you know, it was one of those songs that wrote itself and basically because it was from experience because what had happened was Frida Kelly, the Beatles fan club secretary, had done a, a programme called Good Old Frida, where they'd interviewed her and all that. And then Billy rang me, he's all excited, he said, have you seen Good Old Frida? And I said, no, what? He, he said, watch it. Because Jan's in it, you know, and there's a part where the camera uh, pans across this photograph and she's sitting there at second school. That was about a year and a bit before I met her. Literally, the photograph just looked out of the computer at me and um, there, was, there was a picture from the cabin. After the interview, we said our goodbyes and as I was driving home, I couldn't escape the feeling that with a few different twists of fate, Kenny could have easily been a household name all over the world. But I think Hollywood's loss is Liverpool's gain. Kenny's still here gigging, writing and recording, still the professional musician he was always going to be, and one of the funniest, most talented and nicest people that I know. Kenny Parry may not be world famous, but he's certainly a legendary local.